says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Are you breathing this morning? I think most of you are, and uh, so we ought to be praising the Lord. Should we practice? Let's say praise the Lord. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord. Oh, he is worthy of our praise today. No matter how you feel, uh, no matter the weather outside, although we're grateful that it's sunny and going to warm up to about 60, I think all of us are in favor of that, but it doesn't matter the weather outside, he is still worthy of our praise. And worthy of your praise, no matter what you're going through, no matter what I'm going through. And so I just hope this morning that you will just be a committee of one that says, you know what, I'm going to worship the Lord this morning because he's worthy. And, uh, and then as we do that individually, I believe collectively, uh, we'll have the service God wants us to have in, in this, this time together. So let's just, let's just trust the Lord to give us what we need today. So good to see each of you in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, so good to see Drew Rayfelt from Indiana area. And uh, I tell him, I said, you know, the Lord's already told you to move here. We're just trying to figure out the timing on this. <laughs> well, I'm, I can't tell you the Lord's told to move here. But always glad when he can be here. So good to have Vivian here. Always glad when she can be here. And uh, we're just delighted each of you are here. Let's stand together. Let's invite the presence of the Lord. And let's allow God to accomplish his plan and purposes in our hearts today. Father, what a joy it is, what a privilege is ours of gathering together with your people today. You are worthy of our praise, and so Lord, we gather together and we want to worship you. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that you would help us to exalt you. You said if you were lifted up, if we would exalt you, you would draw all men to yourself. So Lord, today, on purpose, we want to exalt you and worship you Everything that is said and done today as we sing together and pray together and look at your word together, we pray that you would help us to worship you. We open our hearts, we open our minds, we open ourselves up to the control of the Holy Spirit. Accomplish what you want to accomplish in our hearts and in this service today. And we'll certainly give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Remain standing. Let's join the singing. As Brother Randy comes to lead us, let's make a joyful noise to the Lord. Grab a course book there on page 22, top of the page. Come, Holy Spirit, we need thee, I need thee. Lord, help us this morning as we come to worship him. Amen.
how we need his presence, don't we? Hey, man, aren't you glad he gives us a little bit to go to heaven in? Amen. Praise his precious name. If you'd take a little trip with me and you would go to the Brooks Works Road there in Ohio County, Indiana, in the middle of the night, there's a cross. That cross is illuminated in such a way that you can't miss it. And it's on the farm that I hunt on, one of the people that live there. And it doesn't matter where you're at on that farm, you can see that cross. And I thought one morning as driving in there, I thought, Lord, help us to realize the cross of Calvary. That's just a symbol. But aren't you glad for the cross of Calvary? There they stretched out our Savior, nailed his hands and his feet, pierced his side. Aren't you glad for the cross and what it's done for you this morning? We can live a changed life because of the cross. Let's turn to number 144 there. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died. Aren't you glad for that cross this morning? Amen. Turn to number 219, my Savior's love. I'm so glad that he went to the cross for an old wayward preacher boy. Never really went out into deep sin, but I still needed a Savior. I still needed a sanctifier. I'm glad for that Savior's love that reached down. Praise his name. Number 219.
blood, sweat, drops of blood for my and oh. start that uh, verse, he took my sins and my sorrows again myself, <laughs> and, and Randy sang it again. Praise God. Uh, you know, I hope that you focus when you come to church and say, Lord, what do I need to get out of this service? What do I need to have? And every once in a while, God will just hook me into something that I ought to get, and one of them, I think this morning was, he took my sins and my sorrows. And made them his very own. <clears throat> he bore the burden to Calvary. I'm grateful, aren't you? Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I heard about recently a conversation. Somebody was complaining about some of these praise courses that sing the same phrase over and over and over and over again. And uh, I think, now, how many times can you say he's running after me, you know? But, uh, <laughs> and the, the person talking said, and I don't remember who this was, said, well, do you, at your church, do you sing those songs that have five verses Sing all five of them? He said, yes, yeah, sometimes we sing them more than once. <laughs> 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 
well, I love our songs. I, I just do. I'm sorry, but I do. I, no, I'm not sorry. I, I just love our songs. Praise they speak God. to me. Praise the Lord. Well, we want to pray together, and by the way, it's so good to have all of you. Elizabeth, good to see you here this morning. Sister Water, so good to see you and your friends with us today. And uh, we want to pray together. Brother Rowan, would you lead us, please, this morning as we, as we pray? There are several requests that we want to mention, and I'm going to mention them, and then I'm going to do a highlight this morning like I did several weeks ago. I want us to remember our revival coming up in, in uh, March. And uh, I don't know how you feel, but I feel like God's trying to help us. Not just here, but, but a, a, across the country. God's trying to help us. And a friend of mine just texted me this week and said, we've extended our revival by three days. And I haven't heard about that happening in a while. But uh, church in Alabama said, we've, God's helped us so much. In fact, he said, in our revival, there's a man that's been reconciled new man that's been coming, been reconciled to his son after 15 years and for first time is meeting his grandchildren and are supposed to be in church this morning. Uh, all of them, all of them are supposed to be in church this morning, so we want to remember that revival. But Let's pray for our revival, pray for our nation, that we would see revival in our nation. Several are sick this morning. We want to continue to remember the Sankeys. So glad they're able to be here today, but continue to pray. Uh, for them and ask the Lord to give them a special touch. Uh, Joyce Cooper is still not feeling well. Phyllis Borst is physical uh, needs. We want to remember that. Adrian Arinder has been sick. We want to remember Adrian. Uh, David Lawson, this is Dell and Betty's son, is home from the hospital but still on uh, IV antibiotics. And we want to remember them as we pray. David and Dell and Betty. As we pray, Dell and Betty are helping care for David. So let's remember those requests. I believe the Redmonds have a friend that there was a death in the family. Is that right? Let's remember that family as we pray this morning. The Winklers need our continued prayer. I see they're not here this morning. Let's remember the Winklers especially as we pray. We don't always mention this, but I want to mention it this morning. We have numbers of people that uh, are out from time to time in ministry and some that have left us to go minister. And I want to <clears throat> I want to highlight that this morning. We want to remember uh, Rodney Loper is in a revival in Pennsylvania, in uh, Lebanon. Uh, we, I want us to remember Josh Stamper this morning. Josh is filling his pulpit as he does every Sunday. We don't always mention him, but Josh is one of ours. And I want us to remember Josh and his wife as they minister uh, in their church today. The Hallams, um, the Hallams are only able to attend on Sunday night and Wednesday night because they're uh, deeply involved in uh, inner city mission uh, ministry in Cincinnati and work real hard on Sunday morning and through the week uh, other events they have and I want us to pray for them that God would just anoint their ministry as they minister this morning. GBS Choir is also out so we want to remember them as we pray. <clears throat> and then I, I'm, uh, several weeks ago, I, I highlighted families with younger children and asked us to focus on that in prayer time. And this morning, I would like to highlight our families that have teenage children. And uh, you know, <clears throat> there's nothing the devil fights any more than teenage years, maybe. M maybe nothing anymore. And that can be such a challenge and uh, in, in families with teenage children. So I want us to pray today, and I'm going to name them, uh, the families that I, I can, uh, I've written down, and I hope I don't miss any. If you think of any that I missed, you please let me know. David Stamper family, uh, Tim Stamper family, uh, the Wits, uh, teenage children, the Aranders, the Lopers, the Scots, we want to remember uh, the Scott family have teenage children, the, uh, Becky Marshall, uh, the Hallams, uh, the Wilsons, and the Rayfelts. Did I miss anybody? Yes, the O'Donnell. I have it right here. I have it written down, but it wasn't in the straight column. It was off to the side. And I, yes, the O'Donnells. All right. Any others that, I, that I'm not naming? I want us to pray for the parents, and, and I, I can tell you this. Of those families, I don't think we have a bad teenager among us, and I thank God for that. I thank God for that. But 
teenagers are trying to get their feet down spiritually and find their way and navigate through life and changing and growing up and all of those things that are as natural and normal and God-given. But uh, I want us to pray for our teenagers as they navigate life and our parents as they help them. And pray, yes, the Winklers and the Hayes family. Thank you. Uh, the Winkler, I can't believe the Winklers already have teenagers, but they do. And, uh, and the Hayes family who come on Sunday night and Wednesday night. Let's remember those families as well. So let's pray for all of these families. And I believe God wants to make each one of them experience the special touch and help of the Lord uh, in, in their family. Do you have requests you would like to mention? Yes, Byron. Let's certainly remember this. Uh, church in Marion, uh, Byron's mother's church, uh, involved in that ministry and heart-wrenching, sometimes, sometimes desperately needy ministry. So let's, let's remember those families, that church, Byron's mother, and families that have lost, lost loved ones. Yes, Linda. All right, let's remember her sister-in-law's father's family. At sister in law's family, as we pray. Yes, Nick. All right. Let's remember this family as we pray loss of a loved one. Stanley Church is also. I had him on my list. Don't know how I missed it, but. Yes. Let's remember Stanley. Stanley's out sick, but let's also remember uh, our Friends and Family Month begins next Sunday, isn't it? Uh, March so uh, an emphasis on friends and family and I hope you're inviting several have been invited we want to remember that and we have some that are attending our church today that were invited to friends and family a uh, number of years ago many years ago some of them so uh, let's remember that as we pray maybe an unspoken request by a praised hand across the congregation Doug you have a spoken need Let's remember Doug and Joan, they're not the only ones that carry those kind of burdens. And, uh, and I understand that. And uh, so let's remember, and that's, that's not the parents of a teenager, but it's the grandparents of a teenager. And maybe we should mention that across the congregation, other grandparents that have teenagers you carry burden for. Let's, uh, let's remember those requests. Let's stand together as we pray. Brother Rowan will lead us. Let's join together and lift together as he leads us this morning. Our Father, our God, our 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 Yes, yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh God, we look to you today. We look to you today. We ask for your strength. We ask for your touch. Many requests, oh God, be with those that are sick, those that need a special touch. And rejoice. Remember Stanley today. Yes, yes, oh God, oh God. Remember our families and teenagers, oh God. Let everyone give them a deep, deep desire to serve Jesus. They navigate through their life. Please guide and direct them. Build the hedge of boundaries. Oh God, do it for Jesus' sake. We for Jesus' sake. Oh God, oh God. Oh God. Yes, yes. Oh Lord, we trust you today. Oh God, we trust you today. Oh God, we pray your hand would rest upon us on a special Monday. 
our friends and family fund to all God and fill your sanctuary with your presence every hour we we welcome you today. Oh God, may the anointing of the Holy Ghost rest upon him today. For Jesus' sake, for Jesus' sake. Oh God, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Oh Lord. I trust you today. Oh Lord. Come on, Jesus. Many, many birds, many, many requests that have done to come and be your word. So thank you today. Oh God, oh God, please help, please help. Oh God, we're trusting you today. Amen. Oh God, that you will be here today, that you join us today. Oh Lord, we're trusting you, Father. We're trusting you, Father. Amen. Oh God. Yes, yes, yes. Oh Lord. Yes, do it more. Do it more. Oh God. Oh God. We're trusting you today, Lord. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Oh Lord, we trust you today. Yes, yes. Do it, Lord. Touch Brother Moby today. Choir today. Touch God, his wife today. Oh God, please do it, Lord. Amen. Oh God, do it, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Oh Lord, touch the house today. Oh God, we come join you today. Yes, we do. We praise you. We praise you today. Amen. Do what only you can do in our lives. Oh God. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Oh God. Every need and every Do it, Lord, for Jesus' sake. Oh God. Oh God. Do it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Oh God. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Oh Father. For Jesus' sake. As the ushers are preparing to come, we want to make a few announcements, but before we do that, we have a thank you card. And it says, I wanted to thank the youth department so much for doing the babysitting this last month. It was such a blessing to know that we had a ready-made babysitters to take the kids while we got to have a date. I won't soon forget how much we laughed as we went through the awesome marriage booklet. What a great gift to the youth that gave us this by giving us so much kind and helpful advice and help to our kids. We love you all, Sherilyn Strout. So thank you for that, and thank you, Youth Department. They did a great job, <clears throat> and we raised about $250 from that, and that's wonderful. And so we thank you for taking advantage of that. We want to remember tonight that we have our 515 prayer and youth services, and then Faith Builders Plus at 515. Six o'clock is our evening service, and... Pastor Stroud will talk more about that. Tuesday at 6.30 is the ladies' meeting. And then Wednesday is our first mission spotlight service. And so if that's the, something we're doing new. And so you don't want to miss Wednesday evening to hear a mission spotlight. And also it's going to be a prayer focus. We're going to be praying for our upcoming friend and family day. And that's throughout the month of March. And with that... Wednesday evening, we're kicking that off, but then Friday and Saturday, we have a 24-hour prayer campaign <clears throat> starting M Friday, March the 3rd at 9 p.m. and going to Saturday, March 4th at 9 p.m. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass the sheet around. We need 48 people to, that's correct, right? 48? 48 slots are on this sheet of paper. And what we need, it's just 30-minute slots, so you can take 
however many you can do. So, for example, Friday, March the 3rd, it's from 9 to 9.30 p.m. If you would like to do the whole hour, please put your name on both slots. All right, and so we're going to start right down here. We're going to pass it all the way down. So we're going to go to the back, and then it's going to come up and end probably right here with Rita. So if you would like to take advantage of this, and we encourage you to do that. I thought he was saying something to me. We'd encourage you to do that and just fill your name out, all right? So, please, if you are able to do that, now, there probably is some late night owls. That uh, doesn't make sense. Late night owls. It doesn't make sense. What, how do you say that? <laughs> night owls. Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> There's probably some night owls. There we go. <laughs> that can do the like 2.30 to 3. And so if you're a night owl, sign up for that. And if you're an early, early riser, like I'm sure some of you are, maybe you could do the 4 a.m. to 4.30. And then there are a few that may just have to suffer. And just choose a slot that's uncomfortable and the Lord will give you grace, I'm sure. So if, if you can do one of those slots, that will help us out tremendously and I think the Lord will bless that I really do we're going to be having revival soon you can pray for that pray for our Sunday services that God would come and meet us he will and that people will be saved and that souls will be eternally changed forever and let's pray for that and I think this is going to be a great blessing to our church then Wednesday the 8th uh, Brother Witt is going to do the next step. Pastor Stroud is going to talk more about that. Thursday the 9th is our bus convention trip. And during this, this time right now, if you would like to go to bus convention, we will be taking the bus. We'll be providing the food for you. And so if you would like to go on the bus convention trip, please text Pastor Stroud right now or maybe today. You can text him and we will put you on the list. So please take advantage of that. Then Friday... March the 17th is a youth get-together from 6 to 8.30, and so that's a little, little far out there, but just to put that on your radar. All right, I think that's everything. We made it. The ushers are coming now. <clears throat> you for the offering. The Lord bless you for your faithful giving. 
<clears throat> We're going to work Randy real hard this morning. He already led the singing, but he's coming to sing the special God blessing as he ministers to us, and then our pastor will bring the morning message. number and song and I love I love the chorus that says my heart is stirred whene'er I think of Jesus what a beautiful beautiful name praise the Lord thank you for that beautiful number and song praise the Lord well if you have your Bibles this this morning I'm going to invite you to turn in them to first Peter chapter 2 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> we started here a couple of weeks ago, and of course last week we had one of those services without preaching on Sunday morning, and then we had the Union Bible College group on Sunday night, and so <clears throat> we are, we're a couple weeks away from where I began but we're going to look again at 1 Peter chapter 2. We began talking about our identity in Christ. 
We're living in a day when so many are declaring identity crisis. Anybody ever heard of that? <laughs> identity crisis. And with these crises comes all sorts of consequences. There's just so many things that filters down the road of an identity crisis. And I'm concerned that we as followers of Christ know who we are <laughs> because our identity, listen, it affects our behavior and it establishes our responsibilities. Who we are in Christ. <clears throat> I've, I've heard Sherilyn tell the story um, about growing up, maybe... One of her, now Sherilyn was probably perfect, so it was probably one of her siblings that did it, but did something maybe that uh, should not have happened, should not have been done. Um, I don't think it would always have to be an issue of sin. Obviously, if it was an issue of sin, it would be, but, <clears throat> but it could have been just, you know, some misbehavior of some sort. And her mom, or maybe dad at times too, would look at him and say, you were born in the wrong family to do that. <clears throat> That's a good little line, isn't it, for parents? <clears throat> well, there are some things that Christians may attempt to do that we need to say, you're born in the wrong family to do that. <laughs> and I think, really, we could look at the example we used at the, the, the very first time we, we preached this truth and it was talking about newborn babes. And in verse number, uh, number one of, of 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells them, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. <laughs> uh, maybe Peter is just saying you were born in the wrong family to do that. Because now, as followers of Christ, he's saying, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So the responsibility of a follower, of that identity of being a babe in Christ, the responsibility that follows is that we ought to be growing, we ought to be maturing. And so we noted in that, that first lesson, we noted, we talked about the reality of spiritual immaturity. We talked about the rejection of spiritual maturity and then the goal of maturity. But let's read the scripture again. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through, uh, 1 through 17. And as I mentioned in that first message, Peter gives us six identities. And so we've already covered one. And uh, so maybe you'll be able to pick up on the other five as we read through the scripture lesson. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. This is what he's challenging them to do. Desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Well, did you notice any identities for the believer as Peter is writing to the believers? Well, you can look over them quickly. Verse number 2, we mentioned this the last time as newborn babes. Verse number 5, As lively or living stones. Another identity found in verse 5. As priests. In verse 9. As God's people. Verse 11. As foreigners. And verse 16. As servants. Peter is writing to the church. He's writing to believers. And he is giving them these identities. He says, this is who you are in Christ. And with each of these identities, there follows the responsibilities. There's an action that comes along with each of these identities. And we already noted the first one as newborn babes. We are given the responsibility of growth. But now we're going to look, depending on how time goes, we're going to maybe look at a couple of of these identities uh, this, this morning. We're going to look in verse number 5 as living stones. As living stones, Peter gives this to the people there. Peter says in verse 5, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. Paul here is using an analogy here that is important for us to understand. The church of the living God, I would remind all of us this morning, is made up of real people. Paul, or excuse me, Peter refers to them as living stones. Do I need to remind any of us this morning that we are real people? I want you to reach over to the one beside you and pinch them. and Let's just see if they're real, all right? Just do that real quickly. Not hard, not hard. (laughs) But just a real simple reminder for all of us, we are real people, real concerns and real problems and real difficulties and real victories. We are real people. So what does the truth, what truth does this living stone identify or, or identity rather convey to us? Are you ready for this? It's a very, very simple, simple truth. We need one another. So we are living stones built up together. I, I, I want to tell you something this morning. I need you. And you may not think you do, but you need me. We need one another. We, we need each other. Why don't you go ahead and instead of pinching them, let's turn to the one beside you and say, I need you. (laughs) It's a good exercise. You see, the author of the Hebrews understood this truth when he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Just as babies need milk to grow, listen, here's the analogy Peter is giving us. Stones need each other for a structure. One author says, look in your imagination at the building. Each stone is cemented in with other stones and so is part of the building. Listen, no stone is suspended in midair. 
Every stone belongs to the building and cannot be dislodged from it. Are you getting the picture of the identity Peter is talking about? We are part of something bigger than just ourselves. Well, maybe we ought to emphasize this truth by looking at another passage. If you have your Bibles, let's quickly turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And Peter uses the structure as an analogy. But Paul sticks with the human body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 12, Paul writes, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ, he says. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now, Paul says, hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. You see, God is at work in this. God is doing the organizing. God is putting the placing God is putting the structure as it hath pleased him, he said. Verse 19, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And he keeps writing, he says, And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together. Here it is again. God is at work in this whole setup. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. This identity that, that both Peter and Paul use indicates to us that we are a part of a community of faith. I was reading one book and uh, the author recounts a time when he met the emeritus professor of psychiatry at the University of Illinois. His name was Dr. Hobart Maurer. He was well known in his day. He was not a Christian. And he told the author that he had a lover's quarrel with the church. And when asked why, the professor said it was because the church had failed him as a young man and continued to fail his patience. And then he added, the church has never learned the secret of community. Now, I, that, that's kind of, that's painting with a broad brush, you understand. That was, that was his understanding, that was, that was the way he was viewing it, and I don't think that the church has failed in every area people say the church has failed in. He was painting with a broad brush. But it is sad to think that someone thinks the church has failed them because they've never learned the value of community. You know, there's a lot, a, lot, a lot said these days about community, and I understand why. Because it is vitally important. We need each other. Listen, stop right now and consider. I know I'm giving you a lot of, a lot of uh, activities to do on this Sunday morning. But I want you to consider for a moment your life without the relationships that are a result of this church. How long should I take? Not good. Now take that a step further and consider your life without any relationships that are a result of your Christian life. Your Christian experience. In other words, those relationships from previous churches when you were young or your ministry training days at a, at a Christian college. You, you eliminate and you cut off all of those things that were, were benefited, that benefited you. What would your life be like today? I can tell you one thing, life would be much different. 
life would be much more difficult. I ran across this little illustration. Lori was about three when one night she requested uh, the, her mother's aid in, in getting, getting undressed or getting ready for bed. And uh, the mother was downstairs and Lori was upstairs and and the mother said, well, you know how to undress yourself. You know how to get ready for bed. And the girl replied, she said, yes, but sometimes people need people anyway, even if they do know how to do something. <laughs> people need people. I need you and you need me. As we consider the reality that we do need one another, what is it that we need from each other? What is it we need? Well, I think we could go on a quick trip this morning and we could look at a lot of different passages. And maybe, maybe you just want to jot these down. You don't have to turn to them because I'll probably uh, go past you in, in the driving lane, the fast lane. But you can write down the passages. The scripture is full of one another passages. <clears throat> John chapter 13 and verse 34 Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Oh, we can, we can just zoom right by that one, can't we? But that really can hit home. I need you to love me. I need your care and I need your support. And whether you believe it or not, you need my love and you need my support. It's a responsibility that follows this living stone identity. It's a part of the community. We're not off here by ourselves, just a, a solo flight. But we are in this together and we need one another and we need to love one another. Are you loving one another? Oh, this is what Jesus tells us we must do. Love one another. Some of you would, name, would know the name Catherine Bloom. <clears throat> that was before my time, but some of you would recognize the name Catherine Bloom. But she would preach, and she would make this statement. I obviously wasn't there, but I heard she'd make the statement. She said, look around, children. Look around, children. Look at the person that you love the least, and you don't love God any more than that. Because Jesus said, love one another. Oh, friends, we don't get to pick and choose who that is either. Right? We love one another. That's not the only one another passage. Romans chapter 15 and verse 14. Paul says, and I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. The word for admonish means to caution or to warn or to gently rebuke. This is an element of community or fellowship. This, this, is, this happens especially as relationships happen between the young and old. As we who are young, you notice I'm, I'm lumping myself in that. We who are young listen to the life lessons of those who have been there and done that. And maybe got the sweatshirt. But they can give us words of admonition. And we need to listen to the words of admonition. Admonish one another. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. We've been in that, in that passage for quite some time lately, but Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, Paul writes, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. <clears throat> How long has it been since you grabbed the towel and served like Jesus to someone? How long has it been? We need one another. God has orchestrated this whole thing. God is building this structure. God has put the body together. 
We all have different talents. We all have different gifts. And in some area where I'm lacking, I need you. Some areas where you're lacking, maybe you need me. But Paul tells us by love, serve one another. Can I challenge you? Look for ways to grab the towel and serve one another. <clears throat> Often, sometimes we are, our, our mindset may need to be adjusted a little bit. Sometimes we wonder, who, who can do something for me? Is there anybody around that could do something for me? But sometimes we need to change that. Say, who needs me? Who needs me? The act of service is a part of being the living stone. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, another very important one. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I hope you're carrying the burdens of the people of this church with you into your prayer closet. <clears throat> Because we're a part of the body. We're a part of the structure that God has built. We're not suspended in midair, but we're walking this journey with you. And we bear one another's burdens. Ephesians 4.32. Paul says, be ye kind one to another. Be kind one to another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I think this goes with, without explanation. Probably. But I simply need you to be kind to me. I've got to be kind to you. We must be kind enough to care. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 Paul tells the church of Thessalonica, he said, Wherefore, comfort one another. Comfort one another. First Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Ironically, <clears throat> as we're talking about the responsibility of living stones, the word for edify here literally means house builder. To build up. We as followers of Christ not, must not be tearing down someone else's character or reputation, but we must be building them up. We must be edifying one another. This is the identity of living stones. Well, we must hurry to the third one. We're going to get the third one through. The next identity that we find in 1 Peter chapter 2, we find it in verse number 5 as well as verse number 9. Peter ascribes to the believer the identity of priests. Notice, notice it in your, in your Bibles. It's found in two different verses. Verse number 5. <clears throat> he also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. Now here it is. And holy priesthood. The identity is given again in verse number 9. Peter writes, but ye are a royal priesthood. We as believers are identified as priests. What does this mean? What, what does Peter mean to convey to us when he is writing to the believers that we are priests? Well, I think to answer this, we'll, we'll have to first of all discover the role of the priest in the Old Testament. <clears throat> if you were to open your Bibles and you were to study, study the role of priests, you would find that there were two privileges that they possessed that really set them apart from the rest of the Israelite people. First of all, they had access to God. The priest had access into the temple and only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. All other individuals who were not priests were not allowed into the temple. In fact, strict consequences were given to anyone who entered without being a priest. The law prescribed death for them. So clearly we see that the priest enjoyed the privilege of, of access to God. But secondly, the priests were the people who offered sacrifices to God. 
The other, the other Israelites would bring their sacrifice to the temple, but only the priests were allowed to kill the sacrifice and make an atonement for the sin of the people. And so these two privileges of the priests in the Old Testament system was God's plan for that period of time. That's what God orchestrated. That's, what, that's, the, that's the, the vehicle he used for that time frame. God ordained this system to be in place. But I'll tell you that this system was not the perfect plan. This system was not God's plan forever. It would certainly serve as a type of something better to come. And that better way was in the person of Christ. Jesus would become the final sacrifice. The Hebrew writer beautifully writes in chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. He says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Listen, listen to this phrase. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. In other words, listen friend, because of Christ's sacrifice, he has opened for us today a new and living way where we now as priests, a holy priesthood, can now enter into the holy of holies. You and I can have access to God. The privileges once given only to priests, listen, by this this new and living way, the flesh that Jesus died on the cross for us is now made available for us. We are now a holy priesthood. So what's the application? What is the responsibility that's associated with this identity that Peter is prescribing to these believers? Look again at verse 5. He says, he also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. There it is. Now notice what it says next. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Listen, the responsibility associated with this identity of priests is that of worship. The responsibility we have is worship. The priesthood in the Old Testament facilitated the worship of the Israelite people. But now, but now, because of this new and living way, each of us, each believer as a priest is responsible for his or her own worship. You're responsible for worship when you come here. We're not up here doing this for, for you. We may be up here doing our best to lead and, and to, to guide you into worship. But you yourselves, because of a new and living way, you too now can worship. You are a holy priesthood. As priests, we are to offer up approved sacrifices to God. As one commentator has said, not bloody offerings, the blood of lambs and bullocks, but those which are the offerings of the heart. The offerings of the heart, the sacrifices of prayer and praise. It's called sacrifice not because it makes an expiation for sin, but because it is of the nature of worship. Today we no longer offer the bloody sacrifices that the old covenant required and demanded. But we do offer up our worship to God. <laughs> Let me ask you a question this, this morning. What does worship mean to you? <clears throat> think about it just a couple of moments. When I say worship, what do you think of? Do you think of going to church? You think of communing with God? Do you think of giving your tithes and offerings? Do you think of singing songs of praise? Oh, without, without question, these things play a role in worship. But friend, I just want to tell you that worship is not limited to these things. It's not just limited to those things. For a few moments, consider the believer's responsibility of worship. Now, I understand this topic's a broad one. We, we couldn't cover this in a series of sermons. <clears throat> but let's, let's discuss, discuss it briefly. In the Leadership Magazine, one, one individual gives a personal illustration <clears throat> that may help us understand a little bit about worship. <clears throat> and I'll read, it, I'll read it in the first person. But he says, early in our marriage, I gave my wife a terrific anniversary gift. At least I thought it was a great gift. 
He said, he talks about his wife named Susan. He says, Susan, after all, is a farmer's daughter, keeps close watch on the weather. I envisioned her delight and nostalgia when tracking our, while tracking our backyard precipitation on her new rain gauge. <laughs> Guys, if you're looking for ideas, I wouldn't recommend it. But he says, Susan was not impressed. A rain gauge for our anniversary, she asked incredulously. And he said the gauge is now a family joke, a classic example of a gift enjoyed by the giver but not the receiver. And this is what he concludes. A real gift, real worship means knowing what's important to the receiver. <clears throat> if you and I want to be successful in our worship, we must know what is important to God. When we think of worship, we must not give God what we think is important. Rather, we give to Him what He says is important. Worship is not what makes us happy. It's what makes God happy. It's imperative that we understand worship is not just an attitude or an action. It's not going through the motions without spirit. Listen, it's not going through the motions without spirit. Neither is it spirit without the proof of actions. But it's both. If you have your Bibles, I would quickly invite you to turn for just a few moments to... The Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 1. In this chapter we have this truth inferred that worship involves an attitude and an action. The prophet writes to the Israelite people in Isaiah chapter 1 and, and verse number 10. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. And he says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? He says, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Interesting language the prophet is giving. But the Lord, through the prophet, speaks strong words to the people of Israel concerning the sacrifices and worship. He says, I'm full of them. I'm not delighted in them. Bring them no more. They are iniquity. They are a trouble. The sacrificial system was God's plan. But for the Israelite people, it became just actions without the heart. So the Lord commands them in verse number 16, if you keep reading, he says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And then he says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. What was God desiring from their people? He was calling the people to return to the place where the attitude and actions was an offering of worship to God. As it was, there were actions without heart. Just simply going through the motions. And here, through the prophet, God was longing for the attitude. He was longing for the spirit to blend together with the actions to offer up spiritual worship to God. God was not pleased and would not allow divided loyalties. 
Friend, I want to tell you, it's no different today in 2023. This is also God's desire for us today. He wants our entire lives. He wants our attitudes and our actions to blend together in a way that brings glory to God in everything that we do. He's not interested in divided loyalties. He's not interested in lives that live one way on Sunday and another way on Monday. He's not interested in being the main thing on Sunday and the insignificant thing during the week. He's not interested in being the talk of the town on Sunday and the laughing stock on Monday. No, God is interested in individuals who will give all their time and all of their talents and all of their treasures to serve him every moment of every day as an act of worship. Just a simple reminder this morning. Worship is not just something you do on Sunday. It's the way you live your life. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, what? Do all to the glory of God. <laughs> then again in Colossians 3, 17, he states, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Hebrews 13, 15 encourages us to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Our responsibility as priest is to worship. <clears throat> so how can you worship when you leave this sanctuary? You can. You can. You can worship when you leave. How's that going to play out? It's going to play out in a lot of different ways. The way you speak to your spouse. How you interact with your employer. How you handle conflict or how you handle disappointments or whatever it might be going on in your life. It can all be acts of worship. Giving the glory and honor to God. In your life. Well, I was thinking about a song that I want us to close in singing because <clears throat> I wanted us to think about the worship. And I don't even have the number in front of me, but I want us to sing, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. It's number 281. We're going to close by singing this hymn, but I want you to notice. I want you to notice what all this, this song entails in our life. Maybe before we even sing it, let me point it, point it out to you. Verse number two says, take my feet. Take my voice. Verse three, take my lips. Take my silver and my gold. Take my will. And verse four. Take my heart. Verse 5, take my love. And then it says, take myself. And I will be ever only all for thee. That's worship. Every part of us as an offering to God. The places I go, the things I say, the things I view how I spend my money, all of it is an act of worship to God. Let's stand together. We're going to sing 281 in closing. I hope this will be your prayer as we think about this responsibility as holy priesthood, who we are now because Christ has opened the new and living way. We have access. <clears throat> we can offer spiritual sacrifices to God. May this be our pattern. 281, let's sing it together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. At the impulse of Thy love. Take
Father, we thank you for the opportunity that's been ours to be in your house this morning. I pray that you will take the truth and, and somehow communicate it to hearts, <clears throat> the lips that have fallen just in front of this pulpit. We pray that somehow you would be able to pick them up and communicate them and apply them to hearts and the, the ears and hearts of those that have listened. Accomplish your plan in our hearts. We thank you. We thank you for who we are in Christ. We don't have to wonder who we are, but your word tells us, and I pray that you would help us, help our responses to those identities be pleasing in your sight. And for all that you do for us, we'll not fail to praise you. In Christ's name, amen. You are dismissed.